All right. So what I want to do now in our last hour today, our last hour of many, uh, we are going to talk about, um, I want to talk kind of broadly about uh, worship in the early church and how it developed. Um, so what, what I want to do first is look at the, uh, what Christian worship looked like um, in, uh, you might call it in the apostolic period. So in the period of the apostles um, up until uh, about the year 150. Okay? Um, and then I want to look at um, what you might call patristic worship. Um, and patristic worship, I'm, I'm thinking from about uh, the middle of the second century, so about 150 forward, we have uh, a number of developments that take place um, that begin to form um, a number of structures, uh, a number of uh, shifts in theology um, that are important to, to recognize. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into all that. And then I do want to talk about the sacraments and how the, the church viewed, viewed the sacraments. Um, this is always a uh, rather uh, always always conflicting discussion uh, about the sacraments and what happens in baptism, what happens in Lord's Supper. Uh, that happens in the early church. Those those discussions, those conflicts. So we'll get into to all of that. Um, so I want to start though um, with the synagogue. Okay. Um, as the church was formed after Judaism, Christian worship grew up out of and was modeled after the synagogue. So the uh, <clears throat> from the age of Babylonian captivity, the synagogue was and still is an institution of immense conservative power. What I mean by conservative power is is that it is a uh, something that uh, preserves and holds uh, much of Jewish life within it, in the synagogue. The synagogue was the local center of the religious and social life of the Jews, while the temple was the center of their national life. The synagogue f functioned as a school as well as a church. Philip Schaff calls the synagogue the nursery and guardian of all that is peculiar in this peculiar people. So that he means the Jews. So the synagogue was fully organized um, by the time of Christ and his apostles. We see worship in the synagogue was comprised of three elements. It was devotional, didactic, and ritualistic. Pen this somewhere. Ah, oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so. <clears throat> Each meeting of the synagogue included prayer, song, exposition of scripture. That's the Old Testament, of course. Um, and on special occasions, the rituals of circumcision, and wet uh, washings. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like any church you walk into today. The church is modeled after the synagogue. Um, Right. Uh, of course, by divine directive 
from Christ. <clears throat> Our Lord himself worshipped in the synagogue and in the temple. And so did his early disciples as long as they were tolerated there. Further, in the New Testament, we see Paul preach Christ in the synagogues of Damascus, Cyprus, Antioch and Pisidia, Amphipolis, Berea, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus. As I mentioned before, right, the synagogue was um, a major means of preparing the uh, world for the, the coming of the gospel and right, for the preaching of the gospel. So while Jewish Christians conformed closely to the forms and customs of their fathers, as we see, right, kind of the conflict in the book of Acts, Gentile congregations took a more independent form. We see, right, this form play out through uh, the epistles and in Paul's writings. So the elements, uh, the essential elements, right, prayer, song, exposition of scripture, and then the, the rituals um, were uh, transferred and transformed by the spirit of the gospel. Thus, we see the Jewish Sabbath pass into the Lord's Day. We see the Passover and Pentecost feasts become feasts of the death and resurrection of Christ. And uh, we see the end of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So, bloody sacrifices were replaced by the thankful remembrance and appropriation uh, of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross in the Lord's Supper. The washings are replaced. Baptism. So, <clears throat> we'll talk more about the sacraments, but it's good to, um, and always interesting to talk about um, how the church has uh, understood and taught uh, the doctrines of the Lord's Supper, and baptism. Throughout the history of the church, there is much deviation and doctrinal development concerning these ordinances, which are the visible signs and seals that were instituted by Christ. Um, the, to give you a little insight, the word sacrament in Latin, anyone know what it means? It means mystery. Mystery. So they're called the mysteries um, in in the early church. I, I tend to use that word. Um, and I know some some have a you know they want to stay away from it, but I tend to use it. Um, and I think that's a good good word because uh, uh, well, we'll get into that more. Um, okay, so. Um, Related to the beginning, we'll start with baptism. Related to the beginning and the growth of the Christian life, uh, baptism um, is, uh, right, we see a vital ordinance to the church. So the first administration of baptism um, took place on the birthday of the church, uh, after the preaching of the gospel. Um, so some people talk about, okay, what about John's baptism? Um, I tend to understand that was done in preparation for the institution of Christian baptism. Um, that's just an aside. So, okay, so uh, here's what baptism looked like in the early church. The usual form of baptism in the early church was immersion. Okay? Immersion was not pouring. Uh, this is, of course, inferred from the original meaning of the Greek word baptizo, which means uh, literally to immerse. Um, sprinkling or pouring was practiced, uh, but only for those who were sick and dying uh, and who were unable to be immersed in water. Uh, and uh, in, in all such cases where uh, Total or partial immersion was impractical, right, where there was no water. Water is, of course, necessary baptism. Okay. <clears throat> so when we speak of the subjects of baptism, 
we're thinking about uh, who is to be baptized. So um, usually when you talk about baptism, there are four uh, kind of subjects or uh, headings. Okay, so no, 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 there we go. Path of least resistance. Okay. So you have form. So immersion. That's the normative. That's the, the normative form. And then you have subjects. Right? Who is baptized? Okay. So here we're thinking about whether infants of believers are to be baptized or believers. Uh, believers only. The New Testament contains no express command to baptize infants. Neither does the New Testament forbid infant baptism. So in the early church, this was um, a conflict. Um, the first place in which we have any discussion of the subjects of baptism comes from Tertullian, whose letter we read to the martyrs. He, he wrote this in about 205. Um, he protests against the practice of infant baptism. Um, and that appears to be prevalent in his day. So infant baptism is being practiced, and he protests against it. He advised the delay of baptism as a measure of prudence. Um, his reasons are strange to us. Um, Tertullian says that you should delay being baptized because uh, after baptism, um, by sinning again, you might forfeit the ordinance of baptism, the benefits of baptism. So often in this period, um, the belief, uh, and there are multiple beliefs, which we'll, we'll get into more, but Often the, the belief is that baptism takes away original sin, um, that baptism um, is regenerative. Um, there's been several views regarding the nature of baptism throughout the history of the church, and you really see um, various views in the early church. There's really um, no unified understanding. Um, a book that I would uh, encourage you to read and I would recommend um, that explores the various views is uh, written by Jeffrey Johnson and it is called The Fatal Flaw. No, I have no relation to him though, unfortunately. He's a cool guy. So it's called The Fatal Flaw. What he does is he looks at all the various views on, um, on baptism um, and, and what, what is happening when somebody gets baptized. And uh, uh, he's looking in particular at the fatal flaw behind infant baptism. So there are a multitude of reasons why infant baptism takes place. You kind of see that happen, those, some of those ideas pop up in the early church. Um, but that's a, this is a really helpful book. Um, So, the effect, what's the effect of baptism? So you have form, subjects, sorry, I'm a little slow here. Um, so we have, so we really see in the early church, both infants uh, right, of believers, and you have believers. Okay. Uh, the nature uh, that's uh, various, and then the effect. As I mentioned, the effect. Uh, the early church thought that baptism was thought to extend only to sins that were committed before receiving baptism. 
So thus, uh, number put off baptism until later in life so that they would not forfeit the means of grace received in baptism. So, for example, Constantine was not, was not baptized. Uh, he had planned to be baptized uh, on his deathbed, but did not quite make it. Um, so, <clears throat> um, in the early church, though, in particular, the, the great debates and controversies that surrounded the um, surrounded baptism didn't uh, concern the subjects or the effect of baptism. Um, the, the debates around baptism were focused on the holiness or lack thereof of the administer of baptism. So what that means is um, this, this we'll, I'll connect with this later, it's called, called the Donatist controversy. Um, so this issue, the debates that surrounded baptism were really focused on, okay, Let's say you're baptized by a pastor, and that pastor becomes apostate, right? Falls, walks away from the faith. Um, does that mean that your baptism is invalid? Some people in the early church thought yes. Um, and uh, that's what a lot of the controversy is about in the early church, around baptism. So there really isn't a lot of discussion surrounding a lot of also, right, when you think about a lot of these issues, they didn't have time to discuss a lot of these things. Um, in the midst of persecution, um, in the midst of um, other issues, um, they didn't dig into uh, this as much. Okay. So that's just kind of a historical reality. Yeah? When did Tertullian die? Uh, Tertullian died around, I think, 220. So he, he did have the complete New Testament canon. Uh, at that point, probably not. Um, just because he, he might not have had all of, right? Usually what happened is certain areas had particular um, parts of the canon. Um, and that, that always made things yeah. difficult, right? So that's, that's why there's a lot of controversy. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and we'll definitely get into that more as we talk about, about the canon. That's an important factor. Yeah, they didn't have a complete... Uh, New Testament, right? It, the New Testament was complete, but often people didn't have it, right? They, you know, they couldn't find a book, right? The codex was expensive. Um, yeah, that's that's a good good point to bring up as well. Okay, so <clears throat> that's baptism. Questions on that? So, what are you going to write under the effect? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so the effect is that sins. Uh, uh, so forgiveness of sins prior to baptism. And they also see the, this connected with the, um, the Holy Spirit. The conference of the Holy Spirit. What you're is so this is, um, I yeah. Know that I've all the way sure. All the way. Sure. Um, so this is this is from about 150 on. Um, like as I mentioned, um, the f there's there's not a lot of writings we have. Um, like the first place where we have anything about the subjects is 205. So um, there's a few centuries after the, or at least a century after the apostles, right there. Um, so this is, um, I, I'm thinking here of about 100 to about um, 200, somewhere in there. This is kind of what we see. Okay, so then the, the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> So there is a high view of the Lord's Supper in the early church. Um, so it's regarded um, by many as the inmost sanctuary of Christian worship. Um, that this is the this is the time at which um, 
the, the church um, is in the Holy of Holies before the, the mercy seat. Uh, the Eucharist was celebrated uh, in connection with a simple meal. So we see this uh, and its abuse in 1 Corinthians, right? When people were uh, gluttonous, overfeeding themselves, getting drunk on the Lord's Supper. Well, how do you do that with like, you know, a little, little glass of grape juice and, or wine and uh, a little piece of cracker? Well, no, it was, a, it was an entire meal that was, that was shared together. Um, so we see that in 1 Corinthians. Um, by the way, Eucharist means uh, uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to obviously talk about this a little bit when we get to the Reformation, but within the early church, we see three different views. Um, and these are the same views that mark the Reformation um, concerning the nature of the Supper. Okay, so what's happening in the Lord's Supper. Um, so, uh, right in the Reformation, which we'll get to, right, you have kind of three main views the uh, transubstantiation. These are big words. I like to use them, it's fun. Uh, transubstantiation. Uh, that's that's one. And then you have consubstantiation. And then you have the symbolic or memorial view. So we see all three of these views expressed in the early church. I wish there was like a some way that these all tied together, but alas, somebody will come up with it maybe one day. So <clears throat> Ignatius, who I mentioned, speaks of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in a very strong, in very strong and mysterious terms. He calls the bread the flesh of our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls the consecrated bread medicine of immorality, and an antidote of spiritual death. That's what Ignatius says. So I'm, I'm bringing three examples, or well, four examples, to kind of show you different ways in which Lord's Supper is spoken of. And often, right, at different points, different people in the early church use different ways to talk about it. There's no really unified um, language. Okay, so that's what Ignatius said. So he takes a strong and mysterious view. The bread is the flesh of our crucified risen Lord, and it's a medicine of immorality. Immor oh, no, immortality. A medicine of immortality. Okay, Irenaeus. He says repeatedly that the bread and wine in the sacrament become, by the presence of the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the body and blood of Christ. And that when you receive them, you are strengthened in soul and body to eternal life. That's, that's what Irenaeus says. But then he says uh, that the bread and wine, um, I'm sorry, he, he distinguishes the bread and wine from the body and the blood. So at one point he can say, right, this is Jesus' flesh and blood. But then he also distinguishes, right, that there's a symbolic, this is a symbolic aspect. Okay. And then Tertullian. Tertullian, on the other hand, speaks of the bread and wine as symbols. Yet he did not understand them to be merely symbols. In other places, he speaks of eating the body and drinking the blood and participating with Christ, even in the body. Right, so, that, so he speaks of them as symbols, but then he'll also say that you participate with, participate with Christ physically through the Lord's Supper. And then Cyprian also speaks in favor of a symbolic interpretation. 
Yet in other places, he holds communion to be, an indispens to be indispensable to salvation. So this is where, right, uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, we all can look at the, all of this information on baptism, on the on Lord's Supper, and we can kind of pick, pick a piece here, pick a piece here from the early church and say, well, this is what the early church taught. Right? It's easy to just kind of what, what you call quote mine. Right? You could take some quotes here and there, ones that you like, right? and just kind of, there we go. This is the teaching of the early church. Rather, I think it's more important right, to stick to what Scripture says and go no further. Right? Um, yes, we need to hear what the, the church says. Um, we need to pay attention. We need to listen, right? not, not just to criticize, but listen to understand. Um, but also recognize, right, the, the vision that's already here on these, both of these topics. Um, I think that's important. Um, right, uh, if, if you're looking just at, for particular things, you can find them. Um, I think some of that, though, comes, right, some of our uh, issue with that comes in light of the Enlightenment, right? We have to be very precise and particular about very particular things, the other church just wasn't, right? They, they didn't have those same ideas about how to communicate something. Um, and so now in the modern world, it, well, we, we kind of hurt ourselves, I think, regularly. And this is a, a right, something that causes division regularly. Um, and it's often because of what the writers of the early church said. So I just think, right, food for thought there to, um, think about concerning the sacraments in the early church. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, doing good. All right. So, now, having talked about the, um, the tie with the synagogue and then looking at the sacraments, um, I want to look at um, the um, the ways in which the external organization of the church changed and progressed. Um, okay, there are a number of shifts that take place. I want to point out six okay, in, the, in the patristic period. So um, this starts really strongly um, at the end of the second century. So uh, right, kind of as you come into year 200, um, and these things progressed pretty rapidly um, in the early church. Okay, so um, first, the the first shift is the distinction of the, between the clergy and the laity. Distinction between the clergy and the laity, um, right? Or in other terms, between the pastor and his congregation. So, <clears throat> ministry in the Old Testament is marked by a special priesthood that is distinct from the body of people and organized in three ranks. You have high priest, priest, and Levite. We, we got plenty of that in Exodus. Um, this naturally, for the early church, presented an analogy for a threefold ministry of bishop, priest, and deacon. Okay, so they said, high priest, oh, bishop, priest, and deacon. Okay, no matter how we interpret this change, whether it's good or bad, right, the, the change is undeniable. And as I said, it's traced to the end of the second century. 
about the year 200. <clears throat> of course, as I've mentioned, the apostolic ministry instituted by Christ functioned for the purpose of raising up believers from infancy to the priesthood of all believers. Right? This is clearly taught in the New Testament, the priesthood of all believers. Okay? As the apostles gave way to the second and third generations of elders, the distinction of a regular class of teachers from the congregation became more fixed and more prominent. Okay? Um, we actually see this first in Ignatius, uh, in his, his letters um, as he's traveling from Antioch to Rome to his death. <clears throat> so he considered the clergy to be the ne uh, necessary medium of access for the people of God. So the, the, pe the priest or the pastor was necessary to access God. He wrote, whoever is within the sanctuary is pure, but he who has, is outside the sanctuary is not pure. That is, he who does anything without bishop or presbyter and deacon is not pure in conscience. Um, Clement of Rome, writing to the congregation at Corinth, draws a significant parallel between the Christian um, uh, office of priest and the priesthood in the Old Testament. There he creates a distinction between uh, clergy and laymen. Cyprian, another, uh, who was martyred in 258, he applies all of the privileges, duties, and responsibilities of the Aaronic priesthood to the officers of the church. So he says, right, essentially he sees the Old Testament priesthood being transferred through right, the, the Aaronic priesthood, not the, not the Levitical priesthood, but the Aaronic priesthood, different, uh, th all the way through into the church with no change. So essentially, right, uh, very quickly the early church began to teach that you need a priest to have access with God. Okay. <clears throat> so then we have the what's called the sacerdotal view of ministry. It's a big word. Okay, so the the word sacerdotal comes from two Latin words, okay, which which literally translates one who gives offerings. So this is the the view that the the priest and the priesthood continues into the New Testament. That priests must mediate between God and man. Uh, Tertullian was the first to. Uh, express sacerdotal claims expressly and directly on behalf of Christian ministry. So he was the first that we have. Um, again, right, I want you to notice, right, we read Tertullian to the Martyrs, where he says so many good things, right, um, where, like, I would be like, man, I want that guy to be my pastor. But then, right, he does other things where I'm like, whoa, man, this, this, this is not what we see in the New Testament. But again, right, we need to be gracious, uh, especially since they did not have, likely have the completed canon. Okay. Um, so during the third century, it became customary to apply the term priest directly and exclusively to Christian ministers, okay? especially to bishops. They're called priests. Thus, that continues today in the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern. Orthodox Church. So it's that we find as early as the third century the foundations of a complete hierarchy established. With the um, exaltation of the clergy and the tendency to separate them from secular business and even from marriage, uh, for example, started to appear. Right, so there's the separation between 
congregation and the priest now, right? And so the priest is is to be focused on um, the the ministry, right? He's he's supposed to be separate from the the world and the even the congregation that he ministers to. And so um, these ideas are expressed, right? That um, uh, Right, he can't be involved in secular business in any way, and he should abstain from marriage. Um, celibacy was not yet enforced, um, but it was optional, which is always optional. Uh, okay, <clears throat> third is we have a number of uh, subordinate church offices begin to pop up. There. Okay. Um, this is, I just find this to be a very interesting. Um, so, right, initially you have bishop, priest, and deacon in this hierarchy. Then you have the addition of uh, numerous um, offices below the, the diaconate. Um, these are all kind of Minor, what are called minor offices, in about the middle of the third century, okay, this begins to begins to form. So we have, uh, well, we have a deacon. Well, deacon's really busy, so we need a subdeacon. Okay, subdeacons, assisted deacons, and were required. They were the only ones that were required a formal ordination of these minor offices. So, right to to be a bishop, obviously, you need to be or, ordained. Be a priest, you need to be ordained. Be a deacon, you need to be ordained. But if you're also a subdeacon, you need to be ordained. Right, meaning set aside, confirmed by the church. Um, then we have readers. So, right, few people were literate in this period. Uh, so, readers were those who read the scriptures in the assembly and had charge of the books of the church. Right, this is this is where you know you have a lot of books under uh, lock and key. Um, you know, you can go into, or you might get a picture of, in the medieval church of a big Bible with a chain attached to it. Well, it's not because they didn't want people to uh, read it or it was like this thing people weren't supposed to use, but it was because, well, uh, they didn't want somebody to take that because that was very expensive um, and um, needed to be protected. Okay, so we have subdeacons, we have readers, we have acolytes. So acolytes were those who were assistants of the bishop. So they attended to them, they served them, they... Um, in their formal duties and their in their processions, um, so right there kind of help. When the you may see this, I've seen this at like a Roman Catholic church, uh, or if there's a, a big feast that takes place in a Roman Catholic church, you'll have the the, the bishop walk down in his um, vestments, and you'll have some people like carrying his vestments behind him, and it's a little strange, um, but that happens. So um, those are acolytes. Those Right, all these kind of begin to arise in the middle of the third century, so about 250. Um, exorcists. Uh, exorcists begin to pray for and lay hands on those who are possessed by evil spirits, and exorcists al almost always assisted in baptism. So the ways that baptism, the way that baptism was, baptisms were done in the early church um, was, um, and you can see this today actually in the Book of Common Prayer, um, but uh, a part of the ritual of baptism, part of what happens in baptism, according to the early church, is that, um, well, adults, of course, they're to renounce the devil. Um, uh, this was also done for infants. Uh, they believed, right, that apart from Christ, you are under the um, power of the devil. And so um, to be baptized, to receive the Spirit, Right, you must be well, exercised of any de demons. That was their understanding. So exorcism took place often with baptism. Okay, then we have presenters. So presenters were those who conducted musical parts of the liturgy, psalms, benedictions, and responses. And then finally, the janitors. Janitors took care of religious meeting rooms and later churchyards. We have all those... Uh, 
small uh, or minor offices begin to arise in the church. Um, again, right, there are different ways to interpret that, right? Um, but but the reality is we can't, right? That this begins to happen. It's an old, old ancient practice. Okay, so then we have the fourth, the rise of the episcopate. Rise of the Episcopate. So, this is probably the most important changes in uh, the development of church organization. Um, so, this is where we have the distinction then officially between bishop and priest. A bishop and priest. This is where we have um, the uh, The fact that uh, the idea is a bishop is a supreme spiritual office. Okay? And this is uh, retained, uh, once more to this day, by all Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches. And a number of Protestant churches also have bishops. Right? Anglicans, um, I mean, that's the main one. Um, uh, well, Methodist. Methodists are just weird, anyways. Um, so during the lifetime of the apostles, there was no room for bishops. Um, the rise of the episcopate, as I mentioned earlier, came with the death of the apostles. As the apostles um, died away, then we have this uh, rise of bishop. Um, Many will say that the episcopate is a continuation of the apostolic ministry. So um, Roman Catholics are going to say, um, well, the, the bishop kind of just, uh, well, took the place of the apostles. As the apostles died, the bishop came in, bishops came in, in their place. Uh, that um, uh, bishops, um, then that's where they trace apostolic succession. This idea that right, um, the the church must follow uh, a, a lineage, a, dis, a kind of descent uh, from the apostles, right to through the bishops, right. That's how the the idea of the papacy, the pope, the bishop of Rome, is connected. Right? Um, so the New Testament itself speaks only of two offices in the church: of presbyters and deacons. Of right, presbyters, which we Things like pastor or shepherd or overseer and deacon. Okay, that's what we see in a number of the writings of the church fathers. And the threefold view of bishops, presbyters, and deacons uh, arose out of the void that was left by the apostles. Okay, however, uh, however we take that again, right? It's a matter of fact that the Episcopal form of government was universally established in both the East and the West as early as 150. This is another early de development that takes place. That's the rise of this threefold office, okay? threefold ministry. Okay, two more. <clears throat> Almost done. Okay, then uh, Roman primacy. Okay, out of the rise of the episcopate came the germs of the primacy of the Roman bishop. Okay, so the the influence of the Roman bishop grew as it was rooted in public public opinion, um, and the need of unity in the church. So, um, the first example of any exercise of Roman uh, primacy came toward the close of the first century, uh, in a letter uh, of the Roman bishop Clement, um, as he wrote to the Church of Corinth. So what he essentially says is he just appeals uh, to um, the office that he holds as he um, writes to Church of Corinth. So Roman Catholics right, are going to latch onto that very strongly and say, hey, there we have the primacy of the Bishop of Rome and thus the papacy. 
which, right, we'll see it's a development. Um, it's a very uh, rather stark development that takes place. Okay, so um, why does this happen? Well, it's helpful to understand the historical influences that favored um, the ascendancy of the Roman church. Okay, um, it's helpful to yeah, understand just kind of the history surrounding all this. So first, Paul's letter to the Romans shows us that it was likely the oldest church of the West. Rome, the Roman church was likely the oldest church of the West. Okay. Second, the laborers, the laborers, the laborers martyrdom and burial at Rome of Peter and Paul then contribute to its elevation. Third, the political preeminence of Rome in the ancient world seemed to be, uh, it seemed to be the destined place for the power of the church to be centralized. Okay. Um, Rome was the, right, it was the capital city of the world, so why would not then the church rest its power there? Okay, and then fourth, the Roman church led in a number of controversies with wisdom and unity. Right. I think sometimes when we think about um, the the church, the, talking about the Roman Church, um, when we talk about the Bishop of Rome, we automatically um, will just kind of want to shun them or right be very suspicious. And right, um, the reality is is. Rome did a lot to help lead and unify the church in, in the early period. Um, that's, why it, that's why it stood as it did, and that's why it, it grew um, like it, it did through, through the centuries in, in preeminence and in influence and in power. Um, so that's, that's kind of the fifth shift that we see in the early church. And then sixth is we have the unity of the Catholic church. Catholic here means... Universal. So as we'll look at the creeds, uh, um, as we look at the creeds, we'll see, right, the, that we confess, uh, we all confess, all Christians uh, confess um, to be a part of one um, apostolic uh, and Catholic church. Well, Often when we think Catholic, we think Roman Catholic, but um, here what I mean is the unity of the universal church. Um, with each of the organizational changes in the second and third centuries, the unity of the church was established. And they were established not upon the authority of the church, but upon a number of doctrines. Um, we'll look at this more in detail as we continue. But uh, as we'll see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the apostles, the Trinitarian creeds, the symbols of the church, and the canon of scripture established the church in the faith once for all delivered to the saints in opposition to all that is false and heretical. So <clears throat> tomorrow uh, we're going to look at um, how the, the church um, responded to um, heresy and how it uh, established and articulated uh, what we call today orthodox doctrine. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next time. Um, but it's important that we understand kind of the structure of the church before we get into looking at some of those things. All right. Whew. You guys doing good? Well, um, I love to pray and Close out. Any questions though before we? I know again that's I'm going pretty fast. I know I'm covering a lot. I'm using a lot of words. So was there people objecting to this? Or this is like the main um, ideology? You have I mean you have a lot of discussion around it. Um, what what happens though really quickly is and, and we'll get into this as as we look tomorrow, but um, people are going to appeal to a lot of these things against heresy, um, and I think that is a, uh, I think that's a biblical idea, right, that, um, for example, uh, John says in 1 John, um, 
uh, on, I'll paraphrase here. He, he says something to the effect of, right, um, those who are of the faith listen to us, right, the apostles. Um, often what you see uh, the writers in the early church doing when they're appealing against heresy is they're saying, well, you're not, um, uh, you're not tied in with um, the Catholic faith, right? You, you, uh, you're not connected to um, a, um, a bishop uh, who's a part of the faith. So, for example, um, that's, this is obviously a little bit different when you're Polycarp, right? Polycarp's a bishop of Smyrna, and Polycarp, uh, tradition tells us, was discipled by John. Um, it, it seems, right, you're not teaching, right, Polycarp presumably would say something like, you're not teaching what John taught, right? So that, that makes a lot of just like relational sense um, in um, seeking to defend the truth. Um, and so that often often happens in the early church. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so there were times where, when, yeah. When they started giving at it. Do I get to learn all that Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're only four hours I mean, in. Like how 40. deep into this were they before they got a lot of information? In terms of? Like all of these. Oh. Um, I would say, I mean, it's a slow, it's a slow process, and it's, it's sometimes hard to tell from the documents we have, right? Sometimes things already seem to be in place um, when a writer is writing about it. Um, uh, I, I think you see, I mean, throughout the Middle Ages, you see a number of reforms trying to happen. Um, but this structure seems to be in place pretty early on. But honestly, though, I think it's a, um, to, to give an interpretive grid for it, I think it is, as, as a Protestant, I think a lot of it is a historical, it makes historical sense. Um, in the Roman world, in a, in a world of hierarchy, um, makes a lot of sense in a world where there's uh, patricians and plebeians. So um, uh, if you're familiar with the Roman system, uh, the Roman world is kind of separated into two groups of people. So you had the patricians who were wealthy, um, who were landowners, who, were, um, uh, who had power and influence, uh, and they always cared for plebeians, the, the normal everyday person. So that was kind of a regular, there was, that was a regular type of relationship. And so a bishop kind of functioned as that patrician, as that one who cared for the people under him, right? He often had wealth, he had power, he had influence. Um, and that's kind of conferred upon him by the church. So I think that's, there's kind of those historical factors that are there. Um, and those are continued into the medieval world and the whole feudal system, and we'll get into all that. Um, uh, there's another point that was there in a talk about it more, but um, yeah, I think it's largely a historical um, kind of makes historical sense in that world. Um, and I again, right, as we look at the early church, we have to remember, right, it's not um, inspired. Uh, and we, we know that. But the, and this is where it's important though, right, it, but it's also Important that we seek to understand it, right? And um, and there might even be some good in it, right? But again, we have to always bring some things back to Scripture. What does Scripture teach? Um, especially as we look at church history. But the other thing is, and we'll get into this more as well. And there's a very different there are very different presuppositions about the world and about authority in um, the Roman Catholic system and in the Protestant system. Um, and right, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox have some similarities, um, for sure. But I think that that difference, we often talk past each other, right? Roman Catholics, Protestants, because we we are not understanding those presuppositions, right? We're we're thinking we mean the same thing when we talk about tradition, for example. That Roman Catholics mean something completely different than when Protestants say tradition. Um, there's a whole kind of presuppositions behind all of that. So we'll we'll get to dig into all that. For sure. Good question. Yeah, there's 
And that's, that's one of the interesting parts about early church history, though, because there's a lot to interpret. And right, it always goes back to presuppositions. What's your authority? Um, how do you know? Right? I mean, you get back to some philosophical principles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, mm -hmm. so in the early church, well, and this will get into this a lot with canon. Uh, the canon forms over a period. Um, so just the, the nature of the, kind of the history of it. Um, most people didn't have a completed New Testament. Um, and the, yeah, Roman Catholics will say that. That's, that's a fact of history. So then why can't they say that they're wrong? So oh, that, yeah, so that's, that's, that's where... That's where the presuppositions come in, and that's where their view of authority comes in. So, um, and we'll get into that a lot, because that's, that's an important point in the Reformation itself. Um, Luther and Calvin began to have some hearkening back to, the, to actually to some of the writings in the early church. Yeah. Um, they're seeing, hey, there's a different view of authority here, and also digging into Scripture. There's a different view of authority that we see in Scripture compared with what we see in the whole system of the Catholic Church. Right. Um, so, we'll, yeah, I don't want to give it all away. So, oh, you know, come back next time. <laughs> all right, well, let me pray. Oh, it did, it did get warm in here, didn't it? Let me pray and then let you all go. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for this um, time and this opportunity just to dig into um, your book of history. Lord, we thank you that we um, can have that opportunity to learn from the past as we live in the present, Lord. And um, I ask that you might give us um, insights uh, and that you might teach us um, not merely to know, Lord, but to um, love you more um, as a result of seeing your handiwork through your church and in your people. Lord, I ask that you might... Um, Strengthen us, and that you might um, give us rest tonight, uh, and uh, just continue to be with us as we seek to live in uh, the dark world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Right, thank you.